This is section 410, antiderivatives. And our first objective is to find what's called a general antiderivative. When we're done, I'd like you to be able to explain why two parallel functions must differ by the same constant for any given x. To get at this objective, I'd like you to think about any constant function of the form f of x equals c. For this function, f prime of x will be 0 for all x's. Now the issue is we want to go backwards instead of taking the derivatives, we want to begin with the derivatives and find out what the original function was. So if we know that the derivative is 0 for all x's, what can we say about the function whose derivative gave us that 0? The answer to that question is incorporated in our first theorem for the section. And that theorem says if f prime of x equals 0 for all x's in an interval from a to b, then f must be constant on that same interval from a to b. So let's think about what this means for two functions and two functions that are parallel. What happens if the slopes are the same at every point or if f prime of x is the same as g prime? If we look at these two functions y equals g of x and y equals f of x, we can see that for any given x value the distance between the y coordinates is going to be the same. So I could move this distance anywhere along the curve and see that the y coordinates are still going to be the same distance apart. So notice that the two functions outputs are actually going to differ by a constant. So what that means for us is if the derivatives are the same, then the difference of their derivatives will be 0. So the antiderivative of f prime minus g prime, which is f minus g, has to be a constant. Well, if f minus g is a constant, then f will be g plus some constant. Next we have what's called an antiderivative. We say a function capital F is called an antiderivative of little f on an interval if capital F's derivative is the same as little f for all x's in that interval. So for example, let's let f of x equal 3x squared. It isn't difficult to discover an antiderivative of f if we keep the power rule in mind as we go backwards. So what did I take the derivative of that gave me a 3x squared? Well, it's probably going to be something of the form x cubed, because if I differentiate this, I will get a 3x squared, which equals f of x. But if we let capital F of x equal x cubed plus 250, that will also satisfy the condition that the derivative equals little f of x or 3x squared. Therefore, both of these variations of f are viable antiderivatives of f. The question arises, are there any others? Yes, of course, there are millions and millions, an uncountable number of them, and they all differ from each other by a constant. So we have yet another theorem. If capital F is an antiderivative of little f on the interval i, then the most general antiderivative of little f on that interval could be called capital F of x plus some arbitrary constant c. This leads us to our table of anti-differentiation formulas that we're going to be using for the rest of this section. And as we're doing our antiderivatives, we need to be thinking about how we go backwards. So what we have in this first column here is what we've already taken the derivative of to get. And so we want to ask ourselves, what did this come from? What did I take the derivative of that gave me a little c times a little f of x? Well, that would be a little c times the antiderivative, or capital F of x, plus some random constant. If we look here, what did I take the derivative of that gave me little f plus little g? That would be big F plus big G plus an arbitrary constant. This next one, x to the n, well, to go backwards, we have to think about the power rule. So before we get the answer, let's practice going forward just a little bit more. Let's say that I have 1 half x squared, and I take the derivative. I will get an x to the 1. If I have a 1 third x cubed, then when I take the derivative, I'll get a 3 times a third x squared, which is just an x squared. If I have a 1 fourth x to the fourth and take its derivative, I will get an x to the third. By the same token, I can keep going. 
and as long as I have the power and the base of the fraction matching, then when I take the derivative, that coefficient will turn into a 1. So if we look here and we want to know what we came from that gave us an x to the n, then we can see that the power will have to increase by 1 and we'll need a fraction out in front that has n plus 1 as its denominator. So the antiderivative of x to the n will be 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1, all plus an arbitrary constant. Now notice on this power rule that went backwards, we had to specify that n could not be negative 1. And the reason n can't be negative 1 is that if we have a negative 1 here and then we add 1, we'll end up with a 0 on the bottom. And dividing by 0 is not allowed. That does not mean that we can't go backwards when x has a power of negative 1, as it does right here. But we have to think about another function. What did we take the derivative of that gave us a 1 over an x? Well, the derivative of 1 over x looks like it came from the log natural of an x. Because if we remember, log naturals give us 1 over the inside times the derivative of the inside when, they take, when we take their derivatives. So we know that that 1 over x is going to come from an ln of x plus some random constant. Now before we move on, I want to think about this particular function. If we graph the ln of x, remember it's only defined for values of x that are positive. And yet this function has no restrictions on it besides 0. So the domain of the derivative actually is larger than the domain of the original, which doesn't really make sense. So to make sure that we get a full derivative that contains all values of x except 0, we need to have absolute values on the log natural curve. Because if we do that and we graph the log natural of the absolute value here, then its derivative will be 1 over the inside times the derivative of the inside. And we could see that if we graph 1 over x, we will get this picture. And here we see we had negative slope getting progressively steeper. So here were negative y values getting progressively further away from the x-axis. Here we had positive slopes that were getting progressively more shallow. So we start with a very high magnitude positive output on the derivative curve. And then it becomes more shallow as we move on. It. So when we match the domain of the derivative to the domain of the original, we have a viable antiderivative. For this next one, e to the kx, we're going to realize that we have this kx up inside. So we have a function of x inside that exponential. So we've got to kind of think about the chain rule backwards. And if I think about taking the derivative of, say, a 1 half e to the 2x, and I differentiate that with respect to x, I would move through the coefficient, then I would hit the e and leave it alone, and then I would hit the power. And notice that those 2's would cancel, so I'm just going to be left with an e to the 2x. If I repeat that same process with a coefficient of 1 over k, then the derivative would be 1 over k times e to the kx, times the derivative of that power, which would be a k. Notice the k's will cancel, and I'll get that e to the kx. So what this means for us is that the antiderivative of e to the kx will be 1 over k times e to the kx plus some arbitrary constant c. We can apply that same reasoning to these next four because they all have a constant multiple. So if we think about the chain rule in reverse, instead of multiplying by the derivative that is inside, we end up dividing by the derivative of the inside. So when we ask ourselves, what did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me the cosine of kx, it would be the sine of kx divided by the derivative of that inside. We can do the same reasoning here. What do you differentiate to get a sine? Well, that's a negative cosine. And then we'll divide by the derivative of that inside. Same reasoning here. What did I take the derivative of that gave me a secant squared? That's a tangent divided by the derivative of the inside. Same thing here. What did I take the derivative of that gave me secant tangent? That's the secant 
divided by the derivative of the inside. Lastly, we're going to see if you remember those inverse trig functions. This one is the derivative of the sine inverse. This next one is the derivative of the tangent inverse. And this final one is the derivative of the secant inverse. With example 1 now, we're going to apply all those rules that we just developed in our chart. So on this one, if we want to find the general antiderivative, we're looking for what did I take the derivative of that gave me f prime? Well, that's going to be a little f, and we will rewrite this as a negative 4x to the negative 5. And we will remember that we move through the coefficient, and then we hit this power rule, and we have to go backwards. To go backwards on the power rule, we add 1 to this power, and then we divide by that new power. The negative 4's will cancel, and I'll end up with a 1 over x to the 4th plus an arbitrary constant. Here, if we go backwards again, what did you take the derivative of that gave you little f prime? The answer to that is a little f. We move through the coefficient like normal, and then we answer what did I take the derivative of that gave me a sine? Well, that will be a negative cosine of the inside unchanged, and now because we're going backwards, we'll divide by the derivative of that inside. Simplify, and we end up with negative 5 cosine of 3x plus an arbitrary constant. Here, antiderivative of little f prime will be little f. Move through the coefficient. E's do not change when we take their derivatives or their antiderivatives, and we'll do the chain rule in reverse and divide by the 4. We'll end up with 3 e to the 4x plus an arbitrary constant. Next, this looks like a power of negative 1, so we cannot use our power rule to go backwards. Instead, we have to use that log natural. So the antiderivative of little f prime is little f. We've got a coefficient, which is a 3. We'll leave that alone. And then we have this 1 over x, whose antiderivative is the log natural of the absolute value of x plus c. Lastly, we'll do the antiderivative of little f prime will be little f. We see a coefficient of a 2, and then we see a 1 over a 1 plus x squared, which is the derivative of the inverse tangent, plus an arbitrary constant. What I'd like you to do now is think about and be ready to explain why two parallel functions must differ by the same constant for any given x.